I don't think I know Jonathan. Jonathan just left and he's actually, I actually have no idea what I'm going to say. He's a really good just to warn you. Future in okay. the, uh, public policy. That's okay. It's okay. Good to see you finally. <laughs> we'll figure it out. We're going to let Remember you know. figure out how to make it make sense. Make it sense. <laughs> they also don't know what we're going to say, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. So we're on equal footing. Well, it's a small, small circle. Mm -hmm. people who, do we know when we're starting? Like, no. Is there. A cue to start. Yeah, exactly. Does something uh, Min, can you check if we, when we should start? I don't know if we're my phone. Can you check when, when we should start? Like, I don't think. Oh, well, the microphone team is not yet here. Yeah. They're not here. I know. I don't know where they are. Are people late? No, no, oh. just, I mean. Colleagues. Yeah. We're good. Oh, okay. Can we go? Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Well, thank you very much to all of you who have joined us. My name is Gavin Brockett. And I am a representative from Wilfrid Laurier University in Ontario, Canada. I'm a professor and also an administrator, and I provide strategic oversight to a complementary education pathway that our university operates. My role here today is to moderate this panel. And uh, rather than introducing the panelists at this particular time, I will give a short introduction, and then we'll ask them some strategic questions, and they will introduce themselves as they answer those questions. And our focus today is on education for refugees and for those impacted by conflict. The problem is enormous, and the need for education is growing every year as the number of unresolved conflicts increases, as does the number of youth impacted by war. The response of transnational organizations such as the UNHCR, UNESCO, and the World Bank has been limited while higher education institutions themselves have not made this a priority. Truthfully, generations have already been left behind, and we must take action if we are to prevent future generations from being left behind as well. In particular, we must concentrate on women and those marginalized in communities that are affected by war. Today, we want to tackle those problems and not to talk about what has been done, but about what needs to be done, and by identifying the problems that need to be tackled. And we'll start by hearing from somebody who has lived through the experience as being a refugee and seeking education, and from there we will go to the other panelists. So I'll ask Zura to introduce herself and to begin. Thank you so much. I, I am Zura. Um, I'm a former refugee in Uganda. After spending 20 years as a refugee in Uganda, I made a decision to go back to my country. And while on my way to my country, I carried nothing but skills and knowledge acquired from higher education. The skills and higher education that later helped me in transitioning into employment. As I speak to you today, there are only 5% of refugees in access of higher education. 
This is because of the many barriers such as culture, discrimination, and name it. There is a lot of things that uh, we need to do. We need to speak in one voice. We all have the responsibility of speaking in one voice. We need to work together more inclusively and thrive efforts in supporting the refugees, access to higher education. Otherwise, we are in position of losing the entire future generation. Thank you. So let me now turn to ask Manal to, to introduce herself and to speak to the role of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in response to this question and the ways in which the organization has met its commitments and not met its commitments. Great. Thanks very much, Zura, and thanks, Gavin. Um, my name is Manal Stilgaitis. I'm Tertiary Education Officer for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, I'm based in Denmark, but we have a global oversight um, for all of UNHCR's positioning and programs and activities on tertiary education. Um, I, I would start out this discussion by recognizing from our perspective and the humanitarian mandate that we have that over you know, the last 70 years of humanitarian response and refugee action, higher education has never been a priority. And understandably so. Our obligation is to get the youngest children into school within three months of displacement. That is clear, high and above a priority. But over the past several decades, as we've seen that more and more refugees are displaced in protracted situations, that is several or all of their uh, education cycles, the need for higher education, as Zura said, is, is absolutely imperative. It has to be part of preparedness planning, it has to be part of the immediate response, and it has to be part of a longer term view as we think about the humanitarian development peace nexus. There's no more separation between these three areas of work. Um, and I think Zura also pointed to the extension of higher education, or at least one of the extensions, which is then transition to work. And, and as we'll talk about, I think, later in the conversation, each of these has many, many implications right across the 17 SDGs, mm -hmm. right? We're not only talking about refugee higher education. We're talking about what it means if you don't educate a generation of young people who are, by and large, living already in low to middle income countries, right? Where the challenges to access education, the challenges to be involved in legitimate, decent work, et cetera, they're already existing. Without the added skills, qualifications, et cetera, there's very little opportunity for the, the massive number of displaced people in the world to contribute to those societies that are hosting them, much less to return home, as Zura has, and then begin to rebuild and contribute to her own country. So I would say, I mean, again, I think it's really interesting to have the perspectives of UNESCO and the World Bank and UNHCR together, because we all come at this problem from a different but as we're finding more and more complementary viewpoint and stance. So I will, I will leave it there and look forward to hearing the other comments. <coughs> Roberta, how would you respond from the point of view of the World Bank? Super, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm, I don't think my mic is on. Is it? Okay. Oh, now it is. Okay. I'm Roberta Mali Bassett. I'm the global lead for tertiary education at the World Bank. Um, and it's really a privilege and a pleasure to be part of this conversation about how higher education can serve refugee populations and especially the, um, the expanded dialogue that we're having across donor and support organizations like today. Because as Manal said and as we all know, this has not been a key priority area uh, for development uh, in general. You know, the, the higher education has been an issue that we have kept bubbling underneath the surface for a very long time for development as a whole, never mind moving it into the most fragile environments. And this is a transformative moment in the last 20 years or so, really, where this has emerged as a greater and greater uh, issue for organizations like the World Bank, for UNESCO, and in newly for UNHCR, which is fantastic. Um, you know, this, I have a 30 second spiel, which I give all the time, which is that the implications for not doing something are great. And the, the implication for not supporting higher education is expanded global inequity between those who keep racing towards the best quality higher education, the best funded higher education, and those who are focusing on primary and secondary. And it, it matters, primary and secondary. It, of course it does. 
But if you only focus there and you're only focused on fourth grade education and reading at certain levels, the gap is just getting wider and wider. So it has to be present in every developmental inter intervention at every economic level for every country. And this includes refugee education. It includes fragile states. And where the World Bank comes in the most is in the fragile states environment. We work most most closely with governments who come to us and ask for support for higher education in post-conflict environments, in emerging economies, et cetera. We do very little with refugees, and so this is something that we're going to continue increasing our dialogue, especially with UNHCR, mm -hmm. about how we can partner well, and also how to encourage the narrative with our client countries to be more aware of the refugee issue as they are creating higher education policy for their countries as a whole. These are you know, uh, people who are in their countries who can be part of a solution instead of a, a drain on the society, and we want to help support that, that reinterpretation of what refugees can provide and can be in their cultures instead of simply um, you know, a side issue that, that gets pushed aside from, from the global or the bigger national conversation of education. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maki, could I ask you to speak from the perspective of UNESCO? Yes. Thank you very much. Oops. Is it OK now? Just a yes. second. Yep. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like it's working for me. Oh, it is now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you very much, Zora. And uh, uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, my name is Maki Hayashikawa, and I'm the director of the Division for Education 2030 at UNESCO headquarters based in Paris. Now, um, I would like to say that it's also such a privilege for UNESCO to be on this panel as well as. Uh, both uh, Manal and also Roberto was mentioning, I think it's very critical that we have the three agencies together here, given that we have different, clearly different mandates, and we also come in different times and periods when it comes to addressing you know, uh, areas and environmental conflict and fragility. However, we are all working on higher education, and the thing is we are increasingly realizing that it cannot be kind of us coming in at different moments. We have to come together from the very beginning, the humanitarian development and access. We, we tend to kind of divide this into two, mm -hmm. but it's not really the two. It's actually a, a flow of all the process and, and effort that has to be well seemingly tied, to, tied in together. And which means that as agencies here, we have to be starting from the very, very beginning in order to, to support our uh, stakeholders in higher education. Now, for of course, UNESCO, we are not that strong uh, on the ground, I must say, and, and refugee education is not really our, our main mandate. However, of course, UNESCO has been working a lot with refugees, though, uh, but at the lower age group in basic education. And what we ha have kind of started to realize, and, and that is also one of the reasons why we, we have to really come into our education and support and collaborate together with our partner agencies and also with the, the countries, governments, is that often in refugee camps, and maybe here Malak can also correct me, but I think it's the case, that often refugee camps only provide, I mean, education provisions in refugee camps are, are getting better and better, I, I would believe, mm -hmm. but it only serves up to basic education in most cases, and especially it has some implications with the host country's education system. And higher education typically is not part of compulsory education, it's not part of free education, and it's often in their national languages in particular. Whereas refugee camps, which a few refugee camps I have had the privilege to visit, basic education in respect of the refugee population, the language of uh, instruction is often their mother tongue, which doesn't allow them to go into further education in their host countries later on. Mm -hmm. They can't even go back because they don't have the right qualification to do their higher education back home. Mm -hmm. So there's still a lot of systematic issues that have to be addressed, and that's where I think UNESCO wants to come and work together with you know, UNESR and also with World Bank to see how we can actually bring a more coordinated effort, having a more systematic approach to refugees, education, conflict of fragility, uh, fragile situation, and also ensuring that we're not talking about just providing education, but also building building a strong system that actually has a longer term sustainability rather than just going there and providing education for that part, but forgetting about the fact that you know, the refugees do not stay refugee forever, and we hope that they don't, but they can you know, find a new life in their host country or third country, or they can go back home mm -hmm. and ensure that the education, whatever they receive by then, is also recognized in the next um, environment they will be reaching. So mm -hmm. maybe I'll stop here so that I can contribute more later on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Maki, very much. Uh, I'd like to shift the conversation now to bring in the side or the perspective of universities. Obviously, if we are talking about higher education, we need to draw institutions into this debate and into this conversation. I'm going to ask Zura to speak a little more about her experiences and perhaps give a little more context about her own experience in a university and both the challenges of 
being integrated into that institution and also what it did well mm -hmm. before we turn it over to Duncan. Thank you. Thank you once again. Yeah, as refugees, there are a lot of challenges that uh, we normally face uh, after finishing secondary school to being transitioned to, to higher education. And I believe universities uh, uh, play a great role in ensuring that all these challenges are, are resolved. I went to Makerere University in, in, in Uganda and using myself as a test subject, by the time I was joining Makerere, it did not come with ease because after finishing secondary education, I had to stay ar around two years. Mm. This is because the policies doesn't give refugees mm. ease to easily transition mm -hmm. from secondary to, to education, to higher education. So I believe uh, academic institutions, academic higher institutions play a great role in influencing the policies that will enable refugees after completion of secondary education to easily transition into higher education. And I was glad uh, to have uh, obtained uh, access to higher education after attaining the Duffy Scholarship of the UNHCR. Yeah. And that's why I joined Makerere and uh, pursued bachelor's degree in business administration. Mm -hmm. So while, while at Makerere, we realize uh, policies there don't govern actually refugees mm -hmm. because it reached an extent that uh, for we who were under scholarship, we were privileged that uh, our offices could easily negotiate with the university to help us pay the same as nationals, but to other refugees mm. who were not under scholarship mm. and probably other, other refugees who are not recognized. Mm -hmm. They do not carry, the ref they are refugees, mm -hmm. but uh, they have not fully registered. It was very hard mm -hmm. for them as in to, to gain that access mm -hmm. to the universities. Because one, uh, they were made to pay as uh, international students, probably pay in dollars, mm -hmm. and it pushed them to an extent that uh, they were forced, some were forced to even change their nationality just mm. to feed mm. because to pay the same as Ugandans. I believe national, nationality is something that is a privilege. It's something that uh, everyone should be very proud of. And I'm always proud to say that I'm a proud South Sudanese. So I saw that the policy of forcing refugees to change their nationalities to being Ugandans because to be able to access education doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So we as students, refugee students, we decided to come up uh, with an association called MUDASA, Makerere University Daffy Student Association, and the major objective was to foster uh, the refugees' access to education. So in that association, we were able to negotiate with the university to be able to influence their policies to accept refugees as, the, as, as international students, but pay the same as uh, Ugandans. So I'm very glad to, to Makerere University. We did that. It did not come with ease. It was through a lot of efforts, but at last they had to accept. As I'm speaking to you today, any South Sudanese or any refugee pay the same amount as Ugandans. And with that, we have seen a lot of refugees being transited from secondary education to, other, to higher education. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to challenge other governments, because I know it's not only Uganda that is hosting refugees. We have a lot of other countries that are hosting refugees. There is need for them to copy what Macquarie University has done. Uh, it was able to influence the policy to enable that the refugees to fit in in the national system of Uganda's education, and that's exactly what we want. Yeah. Another thing that uh, I've seen that is very interested in Makerere University, they are able to accept the prior learning and also connected learning from refugees because uh, in South Sudan. Uh, we study up to Form 4, we don't have Form 5 and Form 6. Well, in Uganda, you need to, after finishing Form 4, you need to go through Form 5 and Form 6. So, uh, most South Sudanese who are 
only completed uh, Form 4 it, back in South Sudan, we saw that the university came up clearly to accept their qualification through like they have a system that uh, changes that qualification into the Ugandan system. So I do believe there's a lot of things that uh, uh, academic institutions can do. And also one good thing with Makere, uh, it was able to support our, our associations. <laughs> Sorry, we were able to, like when we have outreaches, because I come from, from Africa and as most of you know, I come from South Sudan and education in South Sudan, people have not really accepted education and while in Makerere I, we did a lot to influence the community to change their perceptions in accepting education and I thank Makerere University it has been at the front line to support the students associations student initiative as we are going to do outreaches it was maybe it could offer test books it could offer us pens it could offer us some finances to go and carry out those outreaches in our communities. This can be expanded to, to other universities, including we in Spain, the University of Barcelona can as well do that. Probably support students move, it's very great because with that we carry outreaches and it, it is a way that it changes the community's perceptions towards education. And I speak to you today, uh, the South Sudan community, we all know that uh, by that time, as a girl child, my age, Panawa will be having around five or six children, but because of education, we were able to preach to them the importance, and they have accepted that, and they are ready to, to make their children go to school. So it's a really a collective effort. We need to work together to make all this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Zoda, very much. And the emphasis on gender and the importance of equity is something that we want to highlight on this panel. And you've talked a little bit about uh, Makure University and the role that it has played in responding to the needs of refugees in Uganda. And I want to turn this over to Duncan now. We want to shift the focus to talk about the responsibility and the role of universities in contributing not just to delivery, but overall policy development in providing for education for refugees. And so Duncan, you've worked uh, in the refugee field, sorry, in the education field and uh, with the Times Higher Impact Rankings. Would you mind explaining those and, and commenting on this? Of course, so uh, firstly, thank you so much for inviting me to the panel. Um, my name's Duncan Ross, I'm Chief Data Officer for Times Higher Education. And although we started as a magazine and we still have fantastic journalism, what I've been working on for the last four years is a new kind of university ranking which is focused around how universities are delivering on the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, I think one of the really positive things to come out of that is the, the huge number of universities around the world who are committed to real societal change. And the role that universities can play in that is can't really be understated. And one of the things that um, I think people often underestimate is the sheer economic impact of universities. It's about 1.7% of gross world product is in the higher education sector. And I can't imagine we would be saying, well, we can, we can deal with uh, the, the SDGs without the airline industry because it's only 1% of, of gross world product. So here we have something that's really got power, not just because of the unique approaches it takes to problems through teaching, through research, but also through its sheer economic impact. Um, but there are some interesting challenges that universities face, and I, I think one of them has already been highlighted, which is, of course, universities get their finance partly from fees, but also often from their governments. But the part of government that fin finances universities isn't the part of government that deals with immigration and refugees. And so there's a disconnect there. And I think that's one of the key things that, uh, that the agencies can support, is this idea of can we make governments focus more, in a more holistic way, on the problem. Can they help universities? Because it's hard as a university to set policy if your government is setting policy that is diametrically opposed. I come from the UK, who knows what our government has done today, but it's probably bad. Um, so we have that challenge. And I think there's another critical challenge we have, which is that 
the universities that are best placed to help refugees are frequently those in the countries adjacent to where people are coming from. Because we all know that most refugees don't move very far from, from the, the uh, scene of the displacement. And those universities need to have support from universities more distant. It doesn't do much good for a university in the UK to say, well, we're going to support Ukraine by ensuring that any Ukrainian who comes to the UK will give them a scholarship because our home office doesn't want to let people into the UK very easily. Uh, sorry, if there's anyone from the UK home office here. Well, do more would be my lesson. Uh, my lesson. So there's a real challenge there. How can universities in the UK or America or Canada support universities in Poland or in Romania so that they can provide the support that's necessary on the ground? So these are some of the tensions we see there. But there is commitment, there is desire on the part of universities if we can support them to do the right thing. I think they can be really powerful. So. Duncan has referred to the desire within universities to see change and yet the difficulty of working with government. And I want to ask Manal and Maki and Roberta to comment on the role in which their organizations can play in interfacing with governments in both the global north and the global south to engage those institutions to bring about the change that we're looking for. Because clearly the universities are the engine of change and there are different means by which we can bring that about. Manal, would you like to, to comment on that? Thanks, Gavin. Um, I think we've, we've raised a number of fairly complex issues here. So firstly, um, I would like to recognize that we have a number of university and academic partners at this event and in this room who are actively supporting refugee access to higher education in all different kinds of ways. So there are you know, ways to engage on language, on credentials recognition, on, um, on mobility, on, uh, on bridging and transition. There are umpteen ways that partners are supporting. The question, I think, as you rightly said, Gavin, is how do we put together this puzzle of goodwill on the part of NGOs and universities and specific academic champions and our various agencies that really come in from a bird's eye view and then the interests of states? It's, that's a tough one. And, and I would say particularly, perhaps to, pr to present a really concrete example, is that from UNHCR, we're most often in a position of asking for favors and asking for help, right? When we have three million displaced people in a country, we are most often relying on that government to provide way more than they are in a position to provide. They're often already struggling to provide the same for their own host community. And so then we're in a position where we're saying, here are young people with a huge amount of potential. Can't you also give them access to higher education when your own population only, you know, 2% of your own population has access to higher education? That's a tough ask, right? So then we're constantly going through our Rolodex saying, what are the incentives that we can offer? Where are our points of motivation? How do we bring our interests together? And so, you know, we have our international instruments like the Global Compact on Refugees that really clearly out, you know, outlines our objectives and where we should be able to come together. But in truth, aligning those interests are, it's difficult, it's complicated to do that. And, and again, I mean, these are the conversations that we need to have with partners like the bank and like UNESCO who have the ear of higher education institutions, right? Very few higher education institutions are calling up UNHCR, right? <laughs> Except for like all our friends here in the room. Most are saying, you know, we've got our own issues. The pandemic decimated the world of higher education. Institutions were cutting staff and cutting scholarships and enrollment, etc. And nonetheless, displaced populations have no option, right? There is very little option. Sometimes there's legal barriers to onward movement. Oftentimes, as Zura said, there are, you know, multiple barriers to even accessing or completing secondary education. And so I think that there are, I'll try to end on a positive note, how about that? So what, I guess one thing, you know, in our struggle for, for identification of incentives and leverage and, and commonalities and where we can work together, to me, one of the linchpins, not the only one, but one of the linchpins is student action is that young people coming together from, you know, I don't think it's binary, I don't think it's two sides, but young people from host communities and young people from displaced communities coming together creates massive incentive. 
universities, I mean, Duncan can correct, can correct me, but universities do want to respond to the interests of students. And students, by and large, want to be part of a diverse community. They want access to new ideas and they want to be challenged and they want to be forced to consider all of the different what ifs and the geopolitics, etc. And this is where student interests often align. We have to answer the funding piece, right? We have to answer the scarcity of resources piece. But the young people, A, are the best place to know what the solution looks like, and B, are in a great position to, to apply pressure. Um, and so, you know, I think refugee students and non-refugee students alike, we've seen a huge groundswell over many years. Not, I'm not speaking only with respect to Ukraine or Afghanistan, um, but really responding in very, very concrete and I would say maybe not aggressive but, but determined fashion to say, you know, somebody's got to come up with solutions. We want to be part of the solution. We want more displaced and other disadvantaged students to have opportunity to join us on campus. Roberta, from the point of view of the World Bank, what levers do you have to, to work and to bring institutions engaging, to engage? So I really, I really like this conversation because the bank actually serves in a completely different role than the other organizations who are here. We respond to requests from government for interventions to support tertiary education. So uh, I may, most of you may not know the bank's processes do seem a bit mysterious to people, especially in education. But um, what happens is a country approaches us, uh, the, the World Bank's education practice, and says, we have this problem in education. And if it's a tertiary education problem, then it gets passed to me. And then I, I work as the global lead to find people who can support it in the regions, or I support it myself. But we investigate the problem, we do analytical work, and then we offer uh, advice for how they could borrow against um, you know, global national debt and all other things, but to borrow to resolve this problem. And one of the, the pieces that is coming most clearly is, and from our dialogues over the last couple of years, is that if a government came to us and said we want to support refugee education, we would jump on that. We are so anxious to support our governments, to support the most fragile in their communities, to get higher education. This is uh, near and dear to my heart, but not just me, to the bank as a whole. But we can't and we wouldn't uh, prescribe that to any country. We can offer in a conversation, we can say it's really important, but the, co the country has to come to us. And so where this triangulation happens is when UNHCR, UNESCO is working with a government and says, you have this financing gap to support refugee education. Have you considered approaching the World Bank to have a conversation about whether you could borrow for it? Now, the country would need to borrow for it. They would, you know, in many countries, the poorest countries actually don't have to repay with interest. There, some of, sometimes it's grants, and so they don't have to repay at all, but it's still a process that has to be offered to the bank by the government. Uh, so, but once that happens, then a whole team of people come in and offer uh, you know, potential solutions to these problems. Some of which I see, and maybe we'll get into this later, but there are, um, there are rigidities to the quality assurance frameworks, to the governance environments, to these regulatory environments that make it very difficult to be adaptive, a very agile way to new student groups. So you're going to come in? Yeah, <laughs> okay. If I can in there, I think, that highlights one of the things that is perhaps surprising about this, which is we keep getting surprised. You know, we don't know where the next conflict or the next issue is going to be, but we can guarantee there's going to be one. As we move, you know, this is what the SDGs tell us, is as we move into more and more turbulent times of climate, we're going to see displaced populations because of climate. We're going to see wars because of climate which result in displaced populations. Can we find a way of supporting institutions and governments to plan now for the crises which are going to come in two, three, four years' time, so that they don't come rushing to you at the last minute when they have other things to think about. It's planned, it's ready, it's ready to go. Mm -hmm. It's one of the issues, so we, we presented a new policy framework called the STEER framework. The steering uh, report came out in September of last year at the UNGA, and one of the pieces of that framework is looking at resilience, and it is planning for crisis. It's having uh, you know, institutionalized, established, uh, mechanisms for interventions when it hits because COVID was the great wake up and it should have been. Um, I don't know if many of you might be experiencing this. COVID actually has not led to sustained transformations in uh, operationalization, right? And I'm, I'm, I am surprised by this. I'm surprised how quickly countries are reverting back to old, uh, old fashioned mechanisms when the next crisis is around the corner. Why not learn? Why not evolve? We talk a lot about how blended learning is the future. Many institutions are reverting back away from blended learning already. And we're 
we're not even out of COVID yet. So it's an institutional and it's a governance problem where the old is easier, right? It's easier to fall back on what was there before than to keep pushing forward on what's unknown. But that's what we're here for. We keep trying to keep pushing towards the unknown, yeah. Well, and as someone speaking from inside an academic institution, I can say that we're very slow to make change. Uh, Duncan was sharing with me the other day the, the image, which I think will be worth you remembering, and that is of a dinosaur uh, and a speedboat. And the speedboat are the changes going on around us, and the question is whether the dinosaurs will get on that speedboat or be left behind. And I think this is the, the challenge that we face, that we can sit at the table, we can talk about planning, but universities are actually not very good about long-term planning, or just as organizations aren't. And I wonder, Maki, from a UNESCO perspective in what ways you can help push this agenda forward. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Gavin. And, and I mean, the, my, my co-speakers are really kind of inspiring me with a lot of thoughts and then my little scribbling is getting too messy that I don't even now know what to focus on. But I think um, there's a few things that I just wanted to kind of share because there's, to me, to address this issue and also maybe from the UNESCO perspective, there's three levels that I think we need to address. One, of course, is the, the highest level, which may not come to, to, to you know, implementation right away, but it is really at the so-called you know, normative level. It's quite surprising or shocking to see that you know, we have this uh, the, the convention on the you know, protected right to education called the you know, Convention Against Discrimination Education, Right to Education 1960. Uh, it's been there for ages. However, this convention does not really touch upon higher education. And I think it is high time that we, UNESCO staff, saying this, <laughs> I think it's high time we have to really update this convention in order to cover higher tertiary education because this is one of the first entry points that we can actually come to go to the government and say, guys, you're not doing your job. But of course, conventions to build, to develop one, to amend one, to new, it takes ages. Of course, this is one path which we should do, but we shouldn't be just depending on changing the convention because the actions, especially for education and higher education for refugees and displaced population is not something you can wait 10 years later to happen as <laughs> you were saying also Duncan that you know we have to be anticipating and being agile to, to you know, cope with different situations so that brings me to the mid-level where I think we can start already by changing different systems and, and try to influence uh, by bringing good practices and this is where I'm so inspired by the, the experience that Zora had and also the Macquarie University how did that happen my, my quick big question immediately was what was the incentive to, to have that you know, university change that policy to, to accommodate and receive in a very inclusive manner without jeopardizing so-called the reputation of the university, for example. Maybe Duncan can help us here because one of the, the challenges we have also faced when we talk about, you know, talk with you know, higher education institutions is that they also, of course, especially the privileged university or maybe mid-level university, they care about what they produce and their also status. Of course, it's an academic institution. It's not necessarily uh, social welfare institutions and often they're not really necessarily under the state control. They have full autonomy uh, in many countries and they have to protect their own intellectual uh, prestige and, and you know uh, so if you start bringing all this inclusion I mean this happened years ago decades ago already starting with the issue of disability for example what happens if you bring in this, you know, student disabilities how does it going to affect my class how does it going to affect my profession you know, teachers profession uh, teaching profession why what will be the reputation image of my university which could only be positive from my perspective but for the, the broader society it's not the case so I'm wondering but if we, if we go back to uh, only probably about, about 120 years ago, only two people on this panel would have been entitled to a university education. I leave it to the audience to guess which two. Um, and universities learned. They learned that actually letting women get degrees did not somehow make universities worse. It made them better and stronger. They learned letting people of color into their universities made their universities better and stronger. It's time that they understand that letting refugees into their universities will be part of the same. It will grow them. It will make them stronger. It will give them different perspectives, different life experiences, which will strengthen academia, not weaken it. So indeed, I'm very much looking forward to the new indicator that you're working on, <laughs> which will be an incentive for the academic you know, world to really open up more, uh, kind of open up the policies and, and regulations. But of course, there's also another environment that has to be worked together is the, the, the government. And of course, this is where the policy intervention must come in. And, and also, we have to kind of utilize the potentials of the institutions themselves. UNESCO has been working with higher education institutions for, for many years, of course, naturally, but often for our research work or training work, but we haven't really kind of 
tapped into the potential universities to also trigger in, you know, kind of internal changes together with the, the broader community. We do have a network called UNESCO Chairs and UNITWIND, and which actually connects a lot of universities. However, I think we haven't really kind of tapped into that potential to be able to create a more inclusive environment for higher education institutions, and probably that's, that will be one of the homework that UNESCO would take, it back, take back after this session as well, as my, you know, together with my colleagues. So maybe I'll stop here. Yeah. Sorry to no, okay, no, no, no. But uh, thank you very much. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Oh, really? And uh, we Sorry. have just begun to scratch the surface of a very important conversation. And we would encourage those of you that come from the state sector to consider how you can support your universities wherever you are in the world and prod them, push them to engage. And if you are in a university, how you can ally with governments and with the transnational organizations represented here to take steps in this direction. Now, we've been asked to uh, welcome up to the front here, Marina Mrugo, who is a delegate from the Ministry of Education in Ukraine, and to invite her to speak to you for the last two minutes. Dear colleagues, um, uh, I represent the Ukraine. Uh, I would like to, we are deeply grateful to our international partners, colleagues, friends for the support that you provide to the country in our difficult period. Uh, it is already 84th day uh, that Ukraine lives through the war that is uh, due to unprovoked large-scale military aggression of Russian Federation. 80 days, 84 days, and this very moment, uh, Ukraine uh, suffers the aggressor's troops attacks on Ukrainian cities, on killing uh, civilians, kids and adults, on kidnapping, on raping, on destroying uh, kindergartens, uh, hospitals, schools, universities, and so, forth, and so on. Imagine 1,747 educational institutions is um, suffered, is destroyed by bombs and rockets so far. And uh, more than 144 destroyed to the ground, totally. Uh, that is uh, around a quarter of Ukrainian population is displaced, um, about 7 million to other parts of, the, of Ukraine and more than 5 million to, uh, to the other parts of the world. That is definitely the largest in scale humanitarian crisis that we, uh, we observe. Our students, young people, researchers, teachers, they are at war. They are among troops and they, they die. What do they die for? They die for the values that we discuss here, the values of United Nations, UNESCO, the Ukrainian values, the values of democratic world. And these values are all destroyed uh, by Russian aggressor. What the things that they do uh, in Ukraine are absolutely anti-humanian. And higher education, look at these values that you represent here. You took any of them and you would see the breach of each and, uh, each and all of them at our country by Russian uh, party, by, by Russian troops that is there. Uh, and higher education is, plays a significant role in this. More than 300 rectors of Russian universities signed open letter that supports the uh, intervention, that supports the aggression uh, of Russia to Ukraine. Uh, we believe that um, that is, uh, um, th we know that that are universities that benefited from uh, European, from world international uh, programs, from research with uh, European and international partners, from collaboration, from exchanges. And instead of developing human values, instead of developing UNESCO, uh, supporting uh, uh, UNESCO values, they develop the unhuman one. Ukraine believes uh, that from now, uh, the funds uh, that, uh, uh, the fun, uh, 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 that the funds that goes, uh, the, the world cannot fund the war in Ukraine uh, through the uh, Russian universities. And we ask international partners, international uh, bank, we, we, the partners, uh, to stop funding the war by, by not funding anymore the uh, Russian universities through that. Do not provide uh, technologies for that because they are used for unhuman uh, purposes. Uh, we um, 
think that uh, Russian universities should lose possibility to instill the unhuman values to international level. They should not be represented in leading, uh, like in leadership bodies, in governing bodies of uh, world institutions where these unhuman principles can be promoted. And we ask, we as a country ask you to consider that uh, position because that is very big risk that exists in the in the world that it can continue if it is not cancelled now. We suggest uh, international students to choose the countries with democratic principles and values because it is important, really. And now, uh, what? Uh, this is one side. So please stand with us. We ask for more sanctions because this is the way to stop the war. Uh, however, despite the war, we continue to live and we, conti we continue to, we overlive the first shock. And the Ukrainian system of higher education demonstrated uh, to our mind quite high, quite high level of resilience and uh, ability to adapt. Uh, our uh, universities return to work and our uh, students can get education, even universities uh, under occupied territories because we have managed to relocate them to peaceful territories. So basically, um, all, all higher education institutions can provide their services to a significant extent. However, uh, now, uh, after this first, sh first shock, we view the war, we want to view the war not only as a tragedy as it is, but also as a time for change and possibility. And at this level, we definitely cannot do it alone. We uh, ask for help, we look for help, and we hope for help from international community. Uh, because from different types of help, because we speak about refugees here, but we do not view our refugees as refugees. We look at them as people who temporarily stay in Europe, who temporarily stay in United States, in Turkey, in Asia, in you know, okay, all, all around the world. But we want them home, and we want them home not just as a physical. Uh, I mean, uh, not like uh, like working, let's say, for us, but we work as uh, newly educated people who came back and spent this time forgetting new skills, new knowledge, new experience. And for that, we really should count on you, on, on the international community. And when we speak about uh, uh, help and educational services that you see, you uh, have for uh, refugees, they are applicable for Ukrainians as well. But more important, we as, uh, let's say, uh, from Ukrainian side, we look as a temporary program that are available for them. So the more temporary programs for uh, students, faculty members, researchers, uh, something that can be, uh, let's say, main, uh, learned and brought back with, with, with the person, that is the mainest asset that we can, uh, that they can get during this time. And next one, we are going to, we, we will have to rebuild institutions, some of them from scratch. And this is the chance to uh, build the new uh, philosophy, new buildings and new system of higher education. And again, uh, it, it should not be replica of what, what existed. It should be something on new principles. But again, this is, could be done only in, in the high world, in the large world. And we look for instruments. We understand that some instruments like university to university partnership or um, um, some kind of patronate, uh, some kind of sister universities, all that instruments uh, can be done. And we really ask you that please join Join. I think that everyone would benefit, not only we would benefit from international collaboration, but the world would benefit from collaborating from Ukraine because we really got very unique experience that time. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you very much, Marina. Roberta would like to, to come. I just would like the hear me, if the audience knows that President Zelensky um, did a, a, a 
Zoom call with Harvard University and the American Council of Education, I think, uh, at the end of last week or early this week, to talk about the role of universities in rebuilding Ukraine. And it's available on YouTube. Obviously, I can't show you where, but if you, if you Google it or go onto YouTube, you can find it. I, I watched it when it happened live, but I know that the, the live stream was recorded and available. So he speaks very specifically about the role of universities in rebuilding the country, and it goes to what you were saying about how much they will view this as an opportunity uh, when the crisis ends. So. Thank you very much for participating, to our panelists for their contribution. There's much more to be said, and I encourage you to talk with them. But we're going to turn it over now to the second panel that's following. Thank you.
we're ready to start with. Shall we? Hello, everyone. Hello. Shall we start? Yes. I think we need to start. May I kindly ask to have you be seated? All right. Hello again, um, and a very good afternoon. Um, my name is Guli Nanch. Uh, I'm the co-director of Centre for Asia Pacific Refugee Studies at University of Auckland, New Zealand. Also the founder of an initiative called um, uh, Opening Universities for Refugees, um, where we work in Southeast Asia context. Um, it's a great pleasure for me and a privilege for me to moderate the session. Um, and I would like to introduce my fellow panelists now very briefly, and then we'll take our start. Uh, our first panelist is Professor Arman Erdogan uh, from Beykoz University, Istanbul. Um, and we have uh, Siobhan Koskeren, uh, who is the Student Action of Refugees Access to University Coordinator. We have Dan Webb, uh, Refugee Education UK Higher Education Coordinator. Uh, Rebecca Murray, University of Sheffield and Universities of Sanctuary Steering Group. Um, and uh, Raymond Burton, Executive Director of One Refugee from United States. We have one more speaker, Professor Adrian Little from University of Melbourne, also the initiator of the uh, Welcoming Universities in Australia, uh, pro-international uh, vice chancellor. Adrian Little uh, couldn't make it, uh, but send a video at the end of our panel. Uh, we'll listen to him. Um, so. The focus of our panel is on inclusion of refugees in different national higher education systems. So in a way, we're going to narrow the aperture, what you know, the previous panel did, uh, and we will be concentrating on a different national system, which will be Turkey, UK, United States, Australia, and myself, I'll also talk a little bit about uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, where we worked, uh, as well as uh, with some new developments in New Zealand and Pacific. So we carefully structured our panel because we have a very you know, short time, like 45 minutes. Uh, so without further ado, I'll just uh, start with my first uh, question. And uh, I'll start with you, Arman. Uh, and the question is, um, Briefly, please describe the current situation in your country setting in Turkey. Thank you very much. Is my microphone on? Um, it's my privilege to be here uh, today, to, to be in this panel, and after two years pandemic, uh, sitting in front of the computers in Zoom meetings. So it's nice to be in person here. Um, refugees inclusion into higher education in Turkey has been a great uh, deal of work in the last decade but before going to that topic I would like to say a little bit about the, the conditions or the, 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 the process of the um, displaced Syrian uh, people in Turkey because since the start of the Syrian war Turkey has followed an open door policy for the southeast border and after a rapid and large numbers of influx 3.7 million Syrian refugees are being hosted in Turkey and this makes Turkey the um, largest refugee hosting country since 2014 uh, hosting 65% uh, of Syrian refugees uh, in itself. Uh, initially, these displaced people were situated in uh, refugee camps near the borders, 
but later when the uh, numbers increased and they were allowed to uh, go and um, get settled in different parts of the um, country having free services of health and education. At the beginning, um, they were seen as guests and temporary, and when the uh, Syrian war ends, they would go back to their country. But the conflict didn't end, and integration has become a very important topic, including higher education. Uh, higher education in Turkey is governed, supervised, monitored, uh, and coordinated uh, centrally by the Council of Higher, Edu uh, Higher Education. And access to higher education for the Turkish citizens is done uh, through a very highly competitive nationwide selection and placement exam uh, due to supply and demand imbalance in the country. For the international students, it's done through the universities, individual universities, uh, the applications are done through that. For refugees, since 2011, Turkish government and the Council of Higher Education developed different tracks uh, to facilitate their access to higher education. One of them was to um, transfer their uh, credits if they had uh, documents with them. But of course, in such a, a hurry and in such a displacement, uh, many students, uh, thousands of students, uh, had no documents with them and they were registered as uh, special students at the uh, universities near the borders. But then this was uh, um, uh, a case uh, that all universities accepted uh, Syrian refugees as special uh, students until their uh, recognition process is being done. Now students who finish high school in Turkey can uh, get access like national uh, students in Turkey and they are free from the international tuition fee uh, for the public universities in Turkey. I will talk about some numbers because there is a huge amount of numbers in Turkey. In, uh, just to uh, co uh, compare, in 2011 in Turkey there were only 600 Syrian refugees, uh, Syrian students uh, studying at uh, Turkish uh, universities as international uh, uh, students. But this year, the statistics are very um, fresh, um, uh, 47,000 Syrian refugees are uh, studying in Turkish universities. Um, the proportion of Syrian uh, refugees among international uh, students in Turkish universities is almost 25%. Um, the Syrian population is very young and over half a million Syrian refugees were at the age of university, that's 19 and 24 years uh, old. And if we add the age group 15 and uh, 18, it makes uh, almost uh, 800,000. So the higher education enrollment rate for this group became this year 10% in Turkey, which is almost the double, uh, twice the, the world uh, enrollment rate uh, uh, in the uh, global sense. And it seems that it will be um, very soon uh, get the target of the UNHCR by 2030, the 15%. These were the numbers and the situations, but there are, of course, challenges uh, that needs to be done. And more, uh, much work is waiting for an inclusion, uh, inclusive higher education in Turkey, such as gender, inclusion of gender, um, quality education and employability of those uh, refugees. I think I stop here for the moment. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, Rebecca, would you give us a very brief overview of what's happening in UK? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here with my colleagues from um, 
the University, well, I'm from the University Sanctuary with my colleagues from Refugee Education UK and Student Action for Refugees. And we have collectively been working for over a decade to improve not only access to, but the participation and success of people who've been forcibly displaced in higher education in the UK. Using the term forcibly displaced as an umbrella term to include people who have refugee status, but also anyone holding a temporary form of status or who is in the process of actively seeking asylum. So critical to the UK context is locating the higher education challenges um, encountered by prospective students in their wider experience of navigating the hostile UK environment, a collection of national policies and practices designed to exclude forced migrants, which is particularly evident in the recent um, UK Nationality and Borders Bill. So the barriers blocking access to higher education fit broadly into three categories. So first of all, forced migrants can encounter explicit modes of exclusion orchestrated by the government. For some people, a condition of seeking asylum is that they do not have the right to study whilst their application for asylum is under review. And in the UK, that can take 10 to 15 years sometimes. It can be a very protracted process. However, really, it's within the implicit modes of exclusion that have been far more effective in preventing and deterring people who have been forcibly displaced from studying in higher education. So the 1998 Teaching and Higher Education Act created a, a key distinction between people who had settled status, refugees, and people who are still seeking asylum in terms of anyone actively seeking asylum was excluded from access to student finance, which was essential to pay university tuition fees and maintenance. So over the years, the restrictions on access to student finance have increased. While many people have the right in principle to study, they're essentially denied access through having the funds to make this a reality. Oh, sorry, too quick, sorry. Sorry, I'm trying to be very brief. I'll slow down. Apologies. So, within these implicit modes of exclusion, sorry, I lost my, lost my point. I'll get back to it. So basically, over the years, restrictions on access to student finance and the funding required to access higher education um, have been one of the most significant challenges. So while people can have the right in principle to study, there's the reality, there's having the funds to make this a reality. There are also many other implicit modes of deterrence, evident in contextual challenges, which will be familiar to many people working in this area in terms of recognition of qualifications, language skills, navigating systems and processes in higher education. So financial barriers linked to immigration status remain one of the most significant challenges in the UK. Explicit and implicit modes of exclusion in the context of hostility also act as a form of deterrence. However, restrictions in the UK have been met by considerable resistance, primarily targeting the financial barriers that forcibly displaced people experience. There have been significant hard-won victories over the years such as an established system of sanctuary scholarships, which are now delivered by 80 universities across the UK. And the legal challenges, there have also been legal challenges that have led to, the, to discrete groups securing entitlement to student finance. And there have been multiple other initiatives that have worked on overcoming some of the more contextual challenges that people have experienced. So the resistance I'm referring to has been incremental yet sustained. It's been inspired and led by young migrants and supported by a broad coalition that includes the wider student population, non-governmental organisations, operational and academic staff working at universities, and recently increased, increasing support from some of the national bodies governing higher education. Okay. Thank you, um, Rebecca and uh, Raymond. Uh, you are uh, not coming from a university, you're more initiated than Jill. Mm -hmm. We're all ears. What's happening in the United States? Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting within the United States context because the United States has had a formal refugee resettlement program since the 1970s. Um, but that program, the systems are designed to place um, recently resettled refugees directly into the workforce as quickly as possible um, under the, you know, uh, the desire to have them be self-sufficient. And so for that reason, there's not a lot of time, space, or resources that go into allowing individuals to gain access to higher education, um, both in language acquisition and in terms of their need to work. Um, and so that continues to be a barrier in the United States. Um, there are currently um, no formal um, 
programs around tertiary, accessing tertiary education um, through the resettlement agencies themselves. Um, and there are some small groups that are providing uh, scholarship funding to individuals from refugee backgrounds, um, but uh, those programs are either incidental or are just very um, small in nature. Um, if any refugees are admitted to the United States um, directly into U.S. colleges or universities, um, they're typically entered as they enter as international students, and therefore the cost is very pricely, pricey. Um, Resettled refugees in the United States uh, face a lot of complex barriers, uh, like we've heard about from these, uh, the other countries involved here. Um, but foremost among those are language, language acquisition, the need to work, the high cost of education, um, and um, mental health needs. Um, for those who have uh, experienced extreme trauma. So I work for One Refugee and we work with college students in the United States um, to transition and access higher education and then transition into professional careers once they finish that in a very local context in the states of Utah and Idaho. So we've worked with over 800 students um, and 350 have actually graduated with a degree and have transitioned into professional careers and we're currently working with 370 students. So. Not a lot of time to talk about One Refugee right now, but in the back I did put a little booklet uh, on the chair in the back, so if you want to know more about our program, you can look that up. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll give a little bit um, overview of what's happening in Indonesia and Malaysia, because these countries are uh, the different situation that they're not the signatories of 1951 convention, actually uh, the refugees are not being considered as refugees. They're very wrongly called illegal migrants, where we all know that um, actions can be illegal, but people cannot. Yet that's the, uh, you know, the stigma and the stereotype. And um, people from different uh, countries, from Somalia, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Uganda, um, you know, everyone, every country, uh, actually, you know, uh, lots of people from different uh, country backgrounds actually live in Indonesia and Malaysia and in protracted situations, and some of them more than two decades. And so education, higher education specifically, means more than um, having right to educate oneself or having access to workforce. It means recognition, it means visibility, and it means security. Because once you have that university card and ID, you're secured from police bribe, for example. I'm talking about you know, Malaysia, as I said, also in Indonesia. Um, positive thing is things are changing um, lately. Um, there are a few pioneering institutions who uh, signed certain MOUs with UNHCR uh, and uh, decided to uh, open their doors for refugees. In Malaysia, one of them was Nottingham University. Actually, they had a campus in um, Kuala Lumpur. And in Indonesia, Sampornia University are accepting uh, refugees. Slowly but surely, things are changing. We don't know why. We don't know how. Uh, but one thing we know that the private universities are leading this rather than state universities because that legal barrier is there and because the, uh, you know, uh, the refugees are not identified as refugees and the, the concept of ele uh, legality is there. Um, an initiative called Welcome US Campus. Now recently, I think a couple of days ago, they introduced the uh, private sponsorship model where specifically universities are going to play a major role in this resettlement process. Let's hear more about uh, these changes. Yeah. As I said, Afghan specifically, evacuation in August, and then recent Ukraine in crisis. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, it's actually opened up a lot of dialogue in the United States um, in regards to this very issue. So, recently the State Department has also um, indicated that they're op open to complementary pathways um, to refugee resettlement in the country, and that has spurred a lot of conversations, a lot of partnerships, and so I'm, I actually participated with a group from UNHCR and the President's Alliance and other organizations, other organizations, sorry, <clears throat> who 
to really look at what it would take for the United States government to be able to re resettle refugees um, through tertiary education systems. And so that's, um, that's in the works. We're still waiting to hear back from the State Department on whether our proposal has been accepted, um, but we're hopeful there. Um, and then on the local context, um, thinking about in Utah, specifically where I'm based, um, the Afghanistan crisis specifically has really spurred a lot of conversations within the local, the state government to see if there's ways to um, provide access to higher education for individuals who are asylum seekers or who are designated as humanitarian parolees because they had to flee Afghanistan so quickly. That was the designation that they were given as they um, were able to enter the United States. So um, there's currently legislation that's being put on the table to allow um, both individuals who are um, international students in, in, in the state of Utah to receive in-state tuition as well as to allow individuals who are on that humanitarian parolee status um, access to that government funding as well. So, okay. thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, so we're back for yeah. Um, so although the UK government's response to both crises was relatively slow, uh, especially when compared to some of our European neighbours, we have seen some positive steps forward in the government's uh, recognition of the importance of higher education for these two particular displaced populations. Um, in both crises, it was clear that discussions were occurring very early on amongst relevant government departments and universities and third sector organisations about how we could open up inclusive access to higher education. And this is generally much more positive when compared to previous crises where HE inclusion seemed to be much more of an afterthought. But that all said, to the kind of the practical outworking of some of the more inclusive policies that we've we've seen have been quite slow and ad hoc. Um, slow in the sense that with the Afghan crisis, the government announced very early on a government-funded scholarship program, but we're only seeing that being operationalised now, nine or ten months after the crisis. And ad hoc in the sense that. The policy response has been different for those two different contexts. So for Afghans, there was a scholarship program announced, whereas with the Ukrainian crisis, the Ukrainian students have been treated for all intents and purposes like British students in that they have access to government-funded loans. And so with both policy responses, whilst the biggest barrier will have been addressed, and that's the barrier of finance, financing your degree. These students are still going to come against some of the more contextual barriers that Rebecca spoke about, your language, um, proving your previous qualifications, and navigating the kind of complexities of the UK university system. And I think, crucially, we need to see these more positive policies for what they, what they are, and that is that they are emergency and reactive and nationality-specific policies. So whilst they will undoubtedly facilitate more inclusive access to higher education for students from these very particular national contexts, they sit quite jarringly within the wider policy environment where most displaced students in the UK are still excluded from higher education. So I think what's happened, both of these crises have done, is to, to highlight the exclusion of, of other students who come from other national contexts. So uh, I think at present we can't say that um, the government's response has had a wider impact on HE inclusion for displaced students from other contexts. But as I think Siobhan will touch on a little later, we do see signs for more sustainable change as a result, potentially, of these crises. Great, thank you. Um, Arma, any impact of Afghan crisis, Ukrainian crisis, and 
policies in Turkey, includes higher education? I think ba based on the previous experiences, Turkey developed similar uh, new um, programs and policies for both for Afghan and Ukrainian uh, crisis, I think. But as we saw in the previous uh, panel uh, from the um, Minister of uh, Ukraine, um, um, it, it, this latest crisis in the Ukraine once again showed us that forced migration is no limited uh, to a certain uh, region or certain people in the world. It can happen in the middle of the uh, most uh, civilized um, regions of, in the world. And until the Ukraine war, uh, the Syrian civil war led the highest a number of people uh, who fo were forced to leave their uh, um, uh, homes since the uh, Second World War. But now we don't know what will happen with the Ukrainian war. Um, as I said earlier, Turkey developed new regulations and put it into force uh, to accept both Turkish students studying in the Ukraine and international students studying in Ukraine uh, to be admitted in higher education institutions in Turkey as special students until their uh, credentials and recognition is done. I think around 4,000 applications were received since um, February, but the process is ongoing, so we don't know how many will be accepted um, in future. And with the Afghans, um, uh, Afghan students uh, are um, consisting the 4% of the international students in Turkey. Uh, so even before the, the crisis, the latest crisis in Afghanistan, Afghan students uh, used to come to Turkey as international students, and there are um, 7,500 Afghan students studying in Turkish universities. Uh, but the, 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 the population, I mean, in terms of gender, they are mainly male-dominated uh, students, and it changes um, everything that their um, um, conditions and uh, female um, students are uh, less in Turkey. I think th these are all I can say. It's interesting uh, to watch in a Pacific context um, when Afghan crisis, you know, the evacuation happened this August and followed by, you know, Ukrainian crisis. How the universities in New Zealand and Australia responded actually. They really wanted to respond immediately. But it didn't happen when the Rohingya crisis happened within the same region when millions of uh, refugees from Myanmar left and go to Bangladesh, go to Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia. So when universities approach to us in order to build new policies on that, well, we um, the way we direct them was to focus on the regions, Afghan refugees who have been in Indonesia, in Malaysia for the last decade or sometimes, as I said, too, to prioritize their resettlement. Uh, in, uh, as I said, either New Zealand uh, in Australia. So things, as I said, are changing, but again, very interesting. Um, I remember hearing a term um, uh, in um, Malaysia that there's a first class refugee. And I was saying, what, how can a refugee be first class, saying that if it's been you know, reset, uh, called by the government to come, like from Syria, crisis of Malaysian government wanted to, you know, uh, bring uh, refugees from Syria, they were being, I mean, the universities were all uh, immediately open because they were holding international, uh, you know, um, valid visas with a valid passport, while the Rohingya refugees coming from Myanmar, they are not even refugees, they are stateless. So, as I said, you know, it's, um, it's very interesting to watch the latest, uh, you know, the crisis, the impact on the inclusive higher education. So, 
my last round of questions uh, is on um, how can universities directly get involved in government policies and building new policies for the inclusive higher education, not only for refugees, uh, asylum seekers already in the country, um, newly re um, uh, settled refugees, former refugees in certain contexts, because once you're resettled, it's not easy, still the barriers are there to have an access to higher education or in a stateless context. How universities can offer a change and work closely with the governments. Arman, we'll start with you and then Siobhan um, and Raymond. Um, yes, as I already uh, told in the previous questions that in Turkey uh, higher education is centrally organized and that's why uh, universities are autonomous but uh, some uh, policies are uh, decided uh, from above the government level or from the Council of Higher Education, the responsible authority for higher education. Um, Turkey tries to offer inclusive and facilitated uh, procedures to support uh, integration of refugees and refugee-like uh, populations in Turkey uh, by transferring uh, their credits, by admitting them as uh, special students, by offering admission exams in different languages than uh, in English, French, or uh, uh, for example, Arabic and Russian uh, exams are being uh, developed for these groups and not taking tuition fees from the Syrian refugees who are uh, called uh, te under temporary protection in Turkey in a positive way. And these procedures have ensured uh, those students direct access uh, to higher education without pushing them with bureaucratic uh, or technical uh, barriers. And based on our research uh, we had done for the uh, Syrian refugee students and academics in Turkey, uh, and also on the experiences of Turkey, I can say that to increase inclusive uh, higher education, um, a few um, humble uh, recommendations perhaps I can list. I think revising policies, strategies, and definitions for internationalization to achieve equity, diversity, and inclusion for the refugees. I mean, but uh, can refugees uh, play a role or what kind of role they can have uh, as international students or are they international students? So those definitions has to be retaught and revised um, for, for the, the new uh, conditions. Capacity building and awareness ra raising at the universities for these groups is necessary because many people don't know uh, that their needs, their expectations, their challenges, and etc. Uh, flexible routes for admissions, participation, and graduation levels. For example, in Turkey, enrollment levels are very high, but retention is one of the challenges that uh, students are uh, having. So how to support those uh, to, uh, in case of uh, retention. Uh, training, peer learning, experience sharing mechanisms, tools, programs for professionals and academics dealing with the refugee uh, students. Uh, I think Turkey has developed a, an extensive uh, um, capacity on this in the last um, decade and I hope that it can um, be an example for other countries or institutions. Uh, but open, reliable and updated data is a must in order to develop new uh, policies or to improve the situation uh, what is needed. Um, therefore, perhaps introducing new uh, role models and best examples would uh, cause the, the, the um, positive attitude in the host uh, community and host society. Uh, and for that, 
inclusive uh, communication strategy for all related parties, including the uh, citizens of the host country, is needed. Because in Turkey, what we are facing recently is that because the, the uh, access to higher education for Turkish national students is very competitive, now families, parents are uh, a bit in unrest if uh, after so many uh, refugees or refugee-like students are being accepted as um, flexible, through flexible uh, routes and paths to uh, higher education. Another challenge Turkey is uh, facing is the uh, unemployment uh, rate among youth. So this also will be another indication for the refugees, what they will be doing after their graduation in Turkey. Because in our research, they say that they want to stay in Turkey, they want to get employed in Turkey, and they don't want to go to uh, any uh, third country. So that, um, and in Turkey, since they are accepted as temporary, because they are under temporary co uh, um, condition, um, th this uh, status of temporariness uh, make um, uh, uh, their um, social integration a bit um, more uh, difficult. I think these could be my uh, suggestions to leave no one, no one behind. Extremely important in uh, creating new government policies as well and um, initiating new partnership models as well uh, with different agencies working together. Uh, Siobhan, uh, what can universities do in the UK to do some changes? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, as has already come up a couple of times, it's a particularly challenging policy context in the UK at the moment, so this is a question we're thinking about a lot. And I think the first thing I would say is to not underestimate the impact of institutional change as a first step. And what we've seen in the UK is that what started as quite a small collection of universities setting up scholarships or support for asylum-seeking and refugee students has grown into a movement. And uh, as Rebecca said, we've now got 80 universities with scholarships. Um, and they're, they're increasingly growing in their level of connections, um, especially working together with the third sector. Um, and one of the reasons why the UK wanted to uh, be a delegation here together today is to highlight that importance of partnership work. And that institutional change is also important because it has a wide reach. So when I'm talking about universities, I'm not just thinking about leadership, but also the student body and academics. Um, so the student body have a really powerful role in kind of pushing for perhaps more radical change at an institution. Um, so the um, request for a scholarship for asylum seekers, for example, perhaps started out as something that seemed quite radical. But now in the UK, after decades of student campaigning, is seen as more of an expectation rather than an exception. Um, and students as well can be embedded in their local communities um, as part of STAR. Students are volunteering in their local communities and they bring that experience of connecting with refugees into their future careers and whatever they go on to do in life. So it has a long-term impact. And research as well builds a knowledge base to support calls for change, and that really feeds into the power of changing minds. Universities as well have expertise that they can draw from their direct experience with students. They can monitor the impact of policy changes on their student body, and they can challenge that, um, including supporting individual students with legal challenges, for example, that then do go on to have an impact on the policy environment. And together, these kind of actions can shift the narrative. So they create, as we've seen in the UK, it's creating a network of support, it's improving knowledge and awareness of the issue, um, and that puts universities in a much stronger position then to change policy in a more meaningful way. 
Um, I mentioned already that the impact of connections and partnerships, I think that is um, growing in the UK. So this presents an opportunity for collective calls for change. So as the number of universities with scholarships has grown and the number of universities of sanctuary in the UK has grown, we've been able to work together as a single voice um, for example, before the Global Refugee Forum, submitting a joint pledge to improve access to higher education. Um, and that works as well internationally, so connecting with other universities, connecting with the 15 by 30 campaign um, and the SDGs, and acting then as a bridge between university leadership um, and national governments and trying to amplify that campaign. Um, and then finally, I think the thing I would say is to be pragmatic and, and to take opportunities as universities to engage with government. So as, as Dan explained, the, we've seen examples recently of the government reaching out to universities and engaging with them more on this topic, which is perhaps a result of that long-term growth of expertise that we, we're, uh, we've seen in the UK. So there is an appetite from the government to have an input into policy, even though it's limited. Um, and that, I think, is fertile ground to kind of push for longer, more meaningful change in the long term. Um, and it's often about finding allies in government. So as, as Duncan mentioned in the previous panel, there's often a disconnect between different government departments, but um, finding the opportunities that exist, for example, with the Department for Education rather than with the Home Office uh, can present an opportunity to push within a challenging policy context to push for some practical change. Four or nine. Okay, I think we're running late, Raymond. Uh, because uh, after Raymond, we're going to listen um, Adrian Little to give an Australian, um, you know, a snapshot what's happening there, uh, and then I'll do a very brief wrap up. But we started late. Uh, that's our excuse. All right, Raymond. I'll be, I'll be quick. Promise. So, you know, I think that there are two areas of strategy for, in the United States specifically. There's kind of a national approach and a local approach. So on the national side, um, different college pr um, presidents and university presidents have banded together into what is called the President's Alliance. And they're understanding that their voices together are stronger. And so for, th for that reason, they are able to petition the government and try to throw their weight behind certain legislation legislation that will help in the on the national side of things. Within the local context, um, it I feel like higher education institutions actually can probably be more powerful uh, in the United States in a local context because um, individual states within the United States have a lot of power. And so at the state level in Utah, for instance, we've seen the University of Utah partner with state government to create a full ride scholarship for students from refugee backgrounds where the university will um, pay the first two years of that student's education, followed by the state government covering the, the third and the fourth year. So it's been really um, fascinating to watch. My one caution with all of that is to say that sometimes funding, I know this sounds weird, but sometimes funding is actually the easiest solution <laughs> um, when it comes to scholarships, and I would say that I would be very careful that any scholarship funding is, um, has the commensurate support behind it to support students who are going to college because those retention rates are actually, some, sometimes that is even more important than the access. So. Thank you, Raymond. Alex, can we just play? Hello, my name is Adrian Little and I am the Pro Vice Chancellor International at the University of Melbourne. Although I dearly wish I could have joined you in Barcelona, it is my great pleasure to inform you about the new Welcoming Universities initiative in Australia. Presently, refugee access to higher education in Australia is very limited, mainly because refugees, despite many arriving as children and doing much of their education in the country, are treated as international students. Tuition fees are much higher for international students than their domestic counterparts. 
and government loan schemes are not available for refugees. As a result, participation rates are very low, except for the few that manage to win the humanitarian scholarships which are available in some universities, but in very small numbers. As a result, it is unusual to see much refugee participation in our universities, despite the efforts of various academics across the university sector to rectify the situation. In the last 18 months, there has been a much more concerted effort to develop a coordinated approach to the issue, led by an organisation called Welcoming Australia. They have developed a new initiative, inspired by the Universities of Sanctuary model, entitled Welcoming Universities, to help build a more coordinated approach. Three universities signed up at the outset, the University of Melbourne, La Trobe University, and the University of New South Wales, to help build the standard by which welcoming universities will be judged. It is a great pleasure for the University of Melbourne to be so deeply involved in this work, alongside partner universities and the Welcoming Australia organisation. While the Afghan and Ukrainian crises led to a broad government acceptance of the need to support refugees from these countries, thinking of the issue in terms of higher education has mostly been left to universities. As a result, different institutions have developed a small number of new scholarships or other schemes to help refugees. But from a system-wide perspective, it looks somewhat piecemeal. However, the irony of the Ukrainian situation is that it spurred universities to move more quickly on some of these issues than had hitherto been the case. For example, in the cases of Afghanistan and Myanmar. At the University of Melbourne, for example, we have initiated a new support scheme for displaced and at-risk scholars that will enable a step change in the way in which we deal with these issues arising from a range of countries and conflicts around the world. While it can be argued that universities in Australia were slow to implement these kinds of initiatives historically, the Ukrainian conflict has provided an opportunity for universities to begin to recognise. Okay, you can stop now. Yes. Yeah. Albeit uh, in okay. such tragic circumstances. All right. Okay. That um, said, we've really been asked because there is another session is starting, um, and um, I'm happy to share Adrian's video with you if you're interested please do contact me um, I mean you know my name it's in University of Auckland website you can reach me uh, through email so um, as we you know approach to the end of the panel um, I think we covered a lot within that 45 minutes and the conversation will continue tomorrow. We'll have more panels on displacement, forced displacement and inclusive higher education. UNACR is hosting all these panels. We'll have different country settings. We'll go to different continents this time, Africa and uh, South uh, America as well. Um, these are very important conversations, but they need to lead to something, right? Uh, so after this discussions, after the two days, three days of such a big conference, we need new task force being built. We need new advocacy models being, uh, you know, f um, discussed and you know formed. So, um, and I, I sincerely hope uh, that it will happen. And I really want to thank you to all. Uh, we started late, but. You you did it quite well, um, and um, anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll see you um, tomorrow as well because this is just starting. Please approach this afternoon's two panels as a kind of a prelude, just warming up, and please also join us tomorrow uh, and see the and the entrance of the auditorium student uh, stories uh, from UNACR and Duffy. Thank you.